Thanks for listening. And if you like what you've just heard, don't forget to click so. And please hit subscribe. If you build it, they will come. German Expressionism, Part 1 German Expressionism was a re-energizing and influential movement across the arts in Germany, beginning around 1905 with the Brucker Artists Group in Dresden, comprising architectural students Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, Karl schmidt rottluff Erich Heckel and Fritz Bleil. They shunned the stuffy bourgeois conventions of society and the art world. Other artists and theatre creatives were inspired by the movement, creating a vibrant community of synergy between the arts labelled Gesamtkunstwerk, where architects might write plays or an artist may compose music. Expressionism was a backlash against the rigid conformity of a country ruled by the Kaisers, which then flowered during the following Weimar Republic. In films like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, obedience and respect to regulations was rejected by showing a society of artists and bohemian free thinkers, those who gave free rein to their passions and anxieties instead of becoming obedient automatons, as also blatantly depicted in another expressionist masterpiece, Metropolis. Expressionism was a contradictory philosophy. It was intellectual, yet drenched with strong emotion critical of society, yet keen to create a holistic alternative, and mistrustful of the emerging mechanization of new technology. One of the great paradoxes was that for a group opposed to the political brainwashing of the populace as World War I broke out, many advocates of the movement saw it as a great opportunity to erase the old values of an old world, and willingly volunteered to fight. Across the arts, German writer Nietzsche introduced the inspirational concept of the Superman, and Richard Wagner's music harked back to mythical ages of Germanic gods and heroes for stimulation. As the 20th century began, Freud was influencing the arts with his theories of how our subconscious influences us, and in identifying society's preoccupations with sex and death, he pinpointed themes that would emerge in the films of the Expressionist era. As the madness of war took its toll in Europe, the backlash amongst artists was the catalyst for the anarchic Dadaist movement in Zurich, led by Cabaret Voltaire in 1916. And expressionist painter Konrad Felix Müller helped create the expressionist working group Dresden to engage artists in politically active work reflecting pacifism and socialist ideas. Art that argued for anti-war ideals was not simply a soft expression of peaceful opposition. On canvas, stage, and then film, German art creatives dealt in themes of anxiety and terror, reflecting the fears of a nation torn apart as their military suffered the ravages of defeat. Remarkably for horror film fans, many of the future prime movers of expressionist horror cinema were cultivated under one roof, Berlin's Deutsches Theater under the legendary leadership of writer-producer Max Reinhardt. Konrad Veidt and Werner Krauss, both later to star in The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, Paul Wegener, director and lead in the Golem films and with Krauss in The Student of Prague, as well as Emil Jannings, Mephistopheles in Faust for famed director F. W. Murnau, all worked on plays under Reinhardt before moving into cinema. Silent film was an ideal medium for expressionists to expand into, because its potential for visual impact could incorporate the emotive, distorted shapes and structures already developed by painters and theatre artists of the movement. This unsettling atmosphere could then be reinforced by the external performances of the actors, embodying the human fears and anxieties of the time in passionate, stylized declamatory acting that delivered staccato bursts of dialogue and a jerky, personal or group choreographed physicality, as demonstrated by the cabinet of Dr. Caligari's Cesare or Metropolis's robot Maria and drone-like crowd scenes, for example. By 1918, post-war Germany had become a society whose old, reliable structures had crumbled, the poor were ravaged by diseases such as Spanish flu. The bourgeoisie were no longer insulated by their money. Those who hadn't invested in war bonds found their wealth decimated by crippling inflation. What could offer them comfort or pleasure? The new entertainment mass medium of motion pictures, one of the few successful industries to emerge from the rubble of conflict. 
By 1918, Germany had 4,000 cinemas. A million people went to them every day. As in all modern societies, when hardship strikes, films offer transportation to realms of fantasy and escapism. This was a boom time for German cinema, building vast new studios with ambitions to compete with Hollywood. The movie-going public embraced expressionism, clearly stated in hugely popular films such as The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, The Golem, and Nosferatu. They agreed with its depictions of released passions, bizarre themes and environments, all reflecting a time of upheaval and chaos in society. The atmosphere of openness to new ideas potentially had darker consequences. In his book, From Caligari to Hitler, renowned Weimar-era film critic Siegfried Krakauer argued that iconic characters of expressionist film such as Caligari, Mabuza, and Nosferatu foreshadowed the rise of Nazism in the new Germany. They were sinister, predatory figures, preying on society's subconscious needs to fulfill their own desires, much as Hitler would seduce the country in the decade to come. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, 1920 this silent film is regarded by most as the classic representative film of the Expressionist era in German cinema. It's an intense combination of themes, atmosphere, styles of performance and design that illustrate memorably what the movement was aiming to reflect in Germany at that time. One of the alluring qualities of the film is that the narrative is open to different interpretations. Dr. Caligari deals strongly with reality and illusion, sanity and madness, and it is up to the viewer to make their own determination as to which of the main characters has a believable grasp on either. We open with Francis, Friedrich Feyer, the narrator, who is sitting outside with an old man, and upon seeing a young woman, Jane, in a trance state, Lil Dagover, this triggers him to begin telling his story in flashback, focusing on her as his fiancée. By the end of his tale, we cannot be entirely sure that he is a credible guide, particularly as he recounts events he cannot possibly have been privy to. Nonetheless, Francis describes going to a local fair with a close friend, Alan. They josh about competing for her attention. Elsewhere, the mysterious Dr. Caligari, Werner Kraus, applies for a permit to perform his act involving a somnambulist assistant. The town clerk is rude and later is found murdered. Francis and his friend attend the sideshow, wherein Cesare, the sleepwalker, Conrad Veidt, awakens in his upstanding coffin and allows the audience to ask him questions. Alan naively asks him, How long will I live? Cesare chillingly answers that he has until dawn, prompting the young man to react in a mad mixture of delight and shock. Later that night, sure enough, Alan is murdered in his bed. The resulting police investigation collars a knife-wielding attempted murderer, Rudolf klein Rogger, who denies any connection with Alan's homicide. Francis spies on Caligari's home thinking he can see the sleeping Cesare, who in reality is at Jane's home. He creeps menacingly toward her bed, attacks her quasi-sexually, and then abducts her through the peculiarly sloping streets. He leaves Jane and then falls down dead, seemingly from the excesses of such unusual exertion. Francis realizes the court criminal now has a watertight alibi in his cell. He and the police discover that the sleeping version of Cesare was a cunning dummy. Caligari flees them, with Francis pursuing him to an asylum where he discovers Caligari is the Institute's director and has become obsessed with a medieval Italian sorcerer named Caligari, who'd used a somnambulist to commit murder at his command. Francis believes that, in the throes of identification with the mystic via a disembodied insistent voice, the modern Caligari, we never know his real name, had co-opted a patient into becoming the Cesare we have seen. Caligari screams, I must become Caligari, the hallucinatory order he had been following, and upon being shown Cesare's corpse, he violently attacks his staff before being subdued and admitted as a patient in his own facility. The ending is where the film plays its trump card of ambiguity. Back in the present day, we realize that Francis is actually a patient himself. Sharing his day room is Jane, under the illusion she is a queen, and a very much alive, though still hypnotized, Cesare. 
Francis assaults the director and is taken away straightjacketed to the same cell that Caligari had, thus rendering the plot cyclical. The director assured himself that he can cure Francis. Now he understands the patient's mania. Which of them is truly the insane one now? The script, attributed to Hans Janowitz and Karl Meyer, was thought to be best served by a fantasy style of visuals rather than naturalistic. Walter Heimann and Walter Röhrig, celebrated painters and set designers, applied the talent they were noted for as contributors to the expressionist magazine Der Sturm. All the backgrounds and sets we see in Dr. Caligari are unreal, as though built as backdrops in a theatre production. Houses totter. Very few straight sides are used, where a sloping angle may curve in a window frame or a street. This creates an eerie, otherworldly edge, precisely designed to set us off-kilter and view the scenes as possibly unreal. To create a spellbinding air of unsettling tension, director Robert Viner, a veteran of silent star Henny Porton's films, ensured that the actors played in a passionate, stark, at times unsubtle level, often marked as expressionist. Kraus, as Caligari, has a crazed stare and a wonderful full intensity. Veit, as the sylph-like alien Cesare, moves through the film in a truly hypnotic mode, most vividly when he approaches Jane's sleeping form. He also has penetrating eyes that bore into the audience, such as when he first opens them before the show crowd. The full effect of his piercing glare is enhanced by the stunning 2014 Masters of Cinema HD restoration transfer, which highlights all details marvelously and must be credited for the brilliance of its painstaking repair work on the surviving print. Feyer creates a sympathetic and naturalistic portrayal of Francis, which is vital in earning our sympathy for his ultimate position. Cesare, and even Caligari himself, is a forerunner of other perceived monsters in horror film lore like Nosferatu, Frankenstein's monster, and the Golem, who are equally worthy of sympathy. Whilst Krakauer felt they were cinematic warnings of future malevolent domination of the masses, they are also arguably in the grip of forces they themselves cannot control. The golems need to create destruction, and Cesare's murderous actions are all on behalf of an outside master, who brings a being to life solely to serve as their weapon. Nosferatu's insatiable lust for blood is an addiction that may qualify as the same irrepressible force acting on its slave, exerting as much misery on the doer as any perception that they are relishing monstrous harm, thus reducing them to the status of a poignant victim. In playing with our point of view and allegiances in its plot, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari is a disturbing allegory that in the end proves nothing is what it seemed in post-war Germany. Society's authority figures and morality could no longer be relied upon in this new world order. Tragically, as the saying goes, if you don't have a plan for your life, someone will make you fit into theirs. And in the rise of Hitler, that vacuum was filled with unimaginably atrocious consequences. Happily, the movie's positive legacy is that after it resonated tremendously with audiences of the time, in later decades, it has since become one of the first cult horror movies to gain a huge fan base. In the next episode, I focus on the next famous expressionist movie of the period, The Golem. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening, and if you like what you've just heard, don't forget to click so, and please hit subscribe. If you build it, they will come.